Well, I am thrilled to be with you this morning. Uh, those of you who still have not yet fulfilled your chapel credits for this semester, it is, uh, it is to be, it's great to be with you. I noticed that uh, a lot of people had laptops and uh, cell phones out and that sort of stuff. I'm certain that that is because you want to take copious notes for uh, the message that I'm going to be sharing today. As you just heard, uh, I'm not originally from this country. I'm from Australia and uh, lived here for 15 years now. I got married uh, just over 10 years ago to an American girl because I was about to get deported. And um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just kidding about that. In fact, my father-in-law is a professor here at Lipscomb, and so I am actually kidding about that, Dad. Um, I have three daughters, uh, six, four, and two, and with a dad from Australia and a mom from Nashville. My little girls are a little confused. Uh, they say, g'day, y'all. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it, it's kind, of a, kind of a mess. I know that you have been spending a bit of time in Romans 12 in chapel in the last little while, and I want to lift uh, a theme from Romans 12, if we can, and uh, will not take very long. The one piece of advice that my wife gave me today, being a Lipscomb alumni, is just don't go long. So... Uh, Thought you might have broken out in spontaneous applause at that one. Uh, Romans 12, yeah, thank you for that spattering. Okay, Romans 12, uh, verse 2 says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, I've had a difficult time discerning God's will in my life. I've had a difficult time understanding what God was actually doing. In fact, a lot of the time I wondered whether God was even real. I grew up in a, in a small town in the southern end of Australia and went to a, a small church. And, uh, and I just remember going in and looking around and going, is this it? Is this, is this the, 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 the church of the God of the universe? Is this faith? Is this what God had in mind for people? You know, I talk to people and they'll be like, I have the joy of the Lord. You too could be like me and have the joy of the Lord. I'm like, no, thank you. You know, like, you have the joy of the Lord? Have you told your face? You know, I mean, people had this really unusual interpretation of what it meant to follow Jesus. They would sing songs. They would be talking about the Bible. We would read all of these incredible stories from the Scriptures, and yet no one was experiencing any of these things. It just seemed as though, like you just heard, that the Bible was filled with just rumors rather than reality to actually experience. No one was expecting that God was going to show up at church and there was just going to be this profound sense of God's presence or that he would sweep across a city and do unexplainable things in the city. No one really expected that. Going to church was more like going to a WWE wrestling match, you know? You all know that it's not really true, but you all pretend that it actually is. That's how it kind of felt to me. So when I graduated from high school, uh, I moved uh, to the, the, the nearest city and started attending school there. And uh, when I graduated, uh, I ended up starting working in the, in the workforce and I started attending a couple of churches, but got completely um, underwhelmed by people's experience of Christianity there as well. And someone invited me to this church, and I found a collection of, of young people, teenagers, who were, who were praying and who were seeking God. They, were, uh, they, they had a sense of focus about really wanting to believe that God wanted to do something unexplainable in their lifetime. One of the verses that got quoted often was Habakkuk 3, verse 2. You heard it a second ago. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. And I thought, that verse right there captures the angst of my teenage soul. I've heard that God can do all this stuff, but I just haven't seen it. It's just not actual reality in my life. And then I got amongst these, a couple of these other younger folks who were really starting to see God. They'd start to get up early in the morning and pray that God would, would do something historic in the city. 
So I thought, well, I'm going to check this out. And I got up early in the morning and I went and prayed with these guys. We went up on top of a mountain and we would just pray that God would, would fall on this city, that he would do stuff in schools and in churches. I remember praying one day and just thinking, what does God see when he sees the world? I'm down in, in little Australia. There are all of these other continents around the world. What does God see when he sees Africa and India and China and North America? What does God see? And I started to think about how the world was sort of put together and the influence, particularly of the United States. I grew up watching American television, even in Australia. I watched uh, Sesame Street. I learned to say the, the alphabet with an American accent. That was how I was taught to, to say we watched American TV. And I started thinking about how global brands and, and uh, technology and the media and music echoes around the world emanating out of the United States. And I started to have this sense that maybe I was supposed to move to America. Because if God would do something in America, if God would do something historic here, it would echo around the world. And so uh, through a, a series of circumstances that I, I, I can't, I, we don't have time to get into, uh, I ended up being able to move to the U.S. In fact, the American embassy in Melbourne in Australia told me that there was no way I'd be able to get a work visa. You need one of those to, to live here. And, uh, and so I, I, I applied for it anyway, and they said, you're not going to get it. And I applied for it, and then I packed up everything I had into two bags, and I went to the American embassy in Melbourne, and I walked in, and, uh, and I said my name, and, and they said, yes, so we've got your file right here. And they handed me my passport, and it had this visa that I... I am not eligible to get, and I have no idea, I have no understanding why that actually happened, but I decided not to say, do you know that I don't qualify for this visa? You know, I just ran, and, uh, and I moved here in 98 and started this whole new life, and I was astonished at the United States. You know, this verse says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. It's become my life verse. And it talks about the importance of God. It talks about the story of God. When I moved here, I realized that there is so much about uh, the United States that teaches you that life is about you. I'd never seen so much wealth and so much comfort in the American lifestyle. A few years ago, my uh, brother was visiting me from Australia. We're at a restaurant, and uh, I ordered a Coke, and he ordered a Coke. I drank six Cokes. He drank one. When the waiter came and they put the, the check down, my brother grabbed it and said, look, uh, there's a mistake here. You've only charged my brother for one Coke. He had six. It was obnoxious. I was counting them. And the waiter said, no, it's, it's free refills. I said to my brother, that's no, free refills in America. He goes, free refills? God bless America. I mean, you don't know what you have here. The first time I ever went to see a movie, I walked in, and then they said, get some popcorn and Coke. That's what they do in America. So I walked in, I said, uh, you know, I'll have some popcorn, thanks. They said, what size? I said, give me the biggest size you've got. They hand me this 22-pound bag of popcorn, you know. And then they say, what drink? And I said, well, just give me the biggest size you've got. Every other country in America has small, medium, and large. Not you guys in America. No, you begin with large. Large is the new small in the U.S. Then you have extra large, then you have extra, extra large, and then you have the super-sized Mega Max Thirst Crusher. I didn't know whether to drink it or to bathe in it. And I'm looking at the top of it looks like a spa, hot tub, and then the bottom is nice and small so you can still get it in your cup holder. God bless America. And as I'm walking away, they look at me and they say, do you, do you realize there's one other thing about that size drink? You have free refills. I'm thinking, how long's the movie? A month? I had never seen so much wealth and so much comfort. And when I was like a, as an immigrant looking in at this country, I was just astonished about the fact that everything around us is telling us that life is all about us. And this verse says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. And that life doesn't really make sense until you have this understanding that the story is all about 
God. It is his story. It is starring him. He is the central character. And as followers of Jesus, we get the unique opportunity to play a supporting role with what God is doing in the world. I've heard of your fame and I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Standing in awe of the deeds of God. This is the idea of a standing ovation. I saw a standing ovation a few years ago because a friend of mine named Rachel had had this incredible experience. She had an upbringing sort of like mine where she was pretty underwhelmed with the church, was pretty underwhelmed with people's expression of faith. And then one day someone invited her to go on a mission trip and she went to South America and she worked with those who were trapped in prostitution. And she helped train them for over a month to help them with alternatives to get out of the lifestyle that they were in. She said, I have never experienced the presence of God more than on that experience in my life. And I was living in Chicago at the time, and she came back, and she said, I cannot go back to the life I was living. I need to find these kind of people here. So Rachel started serving women in a strip club in downtown Chicago. And this is crazy, but she would... She was a professional makeup artist. She would do their makeup and she would just serve these women before they went out to perform. She said that sometimes she would play worship music backstage. I don't know what to do with that. They're playing worship music, singing about Jesus before they go out to perform in these clubs. And she would bring sermon CDs in from our church. And one day there was this one stripper by the name of Angela and she said, you know, can I listen to some of these sermons and she said sure and she listened to one and then another one and then she took a box home of these sermons and she just devoured them and she came back in a couple of days later and said I listened to every single sermon I've never heard anything like this and Rachel said Angela do you want to come to my church and she said would I even be allowed in she said yes so Rachel and Angela came to our church and I met them in the lobby And I'll never forget looking at Angela. She had these big false eyelashes on, and she looked at me. She said, so you're a pastor, huh? I said, yeah. She said, do you know what I do? I said, yeah. And she goes, Rachel tells me that Jesus loves me and offers me forgiveness for the choices that I've made in my life. Is that true? And before I got a chance to answer, these tears welled up over these big false eyelashes and started dripping down. And I just had this profound sense, just reminded again of what Jesus does in people's lives. And I said, yes, Angela, it's true. A couple of weeks later, I got to baptize Angela as she gave her life to Jesus. And the front two rows were filled with strippers. There were some guys going, I love this church, you know? But as Angela was coming out of the the baptistry, there was a standing ovation in the house of God. People stood to their feet and they put their hands together. They stood in awe of what God does in changing people's lives. I stand in awe of your deeds. This verse says, renew them in our day and in our time, make them known. This is a prayer that we hear about who God is and we hear about what he does, but we long to see that unexplainable thing happen in our lives and in our generation and in our time. There's this angst that I don't want to die without seeing God do something historic in my lifetime. It's a a call to the church to say, let's not be content with just cultural Christianity, with just a, a collection of positive lifestyle principles and just nodding and then living like everyone else. But let's pray that God would do something unexplainable. So you just heard that we're planting a church here. We would like to plant 20 neighborhood churches over the next 20 years. There's 800,000 people in this area with no connection to a church. There's 100,000 college students, and 60% of them choose to stay after they graduate. So we decided we were going to plant this church, and I want to just close by telling you this. A couple of weeks ago, we decided to have our first info gathering. We had our first time of getting together to tell people about our church. 
And uh, we, we had invited a couple of people to come and join us. We did it at a, at a friend's house. And uh, we had room for 18 people at this house. Had 18 tables and chairs and all of that ready for, for dinner. And on the morning of the event, we found out that 70 people had RSVP'd. And me and my friend Jake were looking at each other going, oh, we've really screwed this thing up. Like, all of these people are going to show up, and this is going to be incompetence on display. They're going to see, like, we can't even organize anything. So I said to him, well, we, can, we need to get some tables and chairs. He's like, well, where do you get tables and chairs from? Do you go to Costco and get a pallet of tables and chairs? I said, I don't know, mate. We, we just need to pray. So we prayed that God would, would, would help us work out the details of this. He looked at me, he said, you plan on what you're going to say, and then I'm going to go and find tables and chairs. I said, okay. He goes, well, I'm going to go and have lunch with my wife at our house, and then I'll go and, and, and look out for him. I said, fine. So he went to his house, he pulled up in his driveway, and as he was getting out of his car, there was a U-hole parked right next to him. He stepped around the back of the U-hole, he opened up the, the, the door, and he looked in there, and it was filled with tables and chairs right next to his house. So he walked on, knocked on the door, and, and said, excuse me, are these your tables and chairs? And he said, yes, weird neighbor, they are. He said, uh, do you ever rent them out? He said, no. He said, would you rent them out? He said, well, what do you want them for? He said, well, we've got this meeting, we're starting this church, and this guy goes, well, let me just take them. He goes, well, let me, let me drive them over, and I'll help you set them up. So they drove over, they spent the next two hours setting up these tables and chairs at this house so we had enough room and enough tables and chairs for everyone. And then while they were talking, he started talking about the fact that he and his wife were separated and his two young girls were really devastated about this and he was having a hard time. And he looked at Jake and he said, can I come to your meeting tonight? And Jake said, no. No, no he didn't. He said, yes, of, of course you can come. So a couple of hours later, we've got all these tables and chairs, and we've got all these people coming, and this guy that we just met a couple of hours ago is sitting right in the middle. And I start talking about the kind of church that we're trying to begin. And I said, there's three kinds of people. There's those who are going to say, you know, when you begin, let me know, and I'll come and join you. There's the next group who said, I'll, I'll meet with you the next couple of months, you know, maybe once or twice. And then the last group is the group that are going to say, you know, this is going to take a lot of our time and energy and resources and efforts. We're going to meet every week. We're going to pray together. We're going to worship together. Some of us are going to fast for 40 days from food or from coffee or from social media or whatever it is so that we can ask that God would do something historic. And before I get a chance to even finish, the tables and chairs bloke puts his hand up. And I said, yes, you, I don't know your name. And he said... He said, I'm on that team. I'm on the launch team. And I thought, let the history books of our church reflect that the first person to ever join our team to plant this church was the guy that we met a couple of hours ago. And we were just astonished that God would provide tables and chairs, but he said, now the real miracle is on my side. He said, my life is falling apart and God sends a pastor to my door to invite me into this thing. And when I read this verse, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. It places an appetite in my soul to want to see God do something unexplainable in my lifetime and in your lifetime and in your life. What's... What's on your agenda for after you graduate from school? You just get a job, you get married, and you live a comfortable lifestyle. Is that what you have in store? Or maybe God wants to cause the church and the next generation, the future of the church, to come together to pray that God would do something, that he would display his fame and his deeds in our generation and in our lifetime. And that we would see him do something historic. That there would be a standing ovation in awe of the deeds of God. That's what I'm praying for. And I'd invite you to join me in praying for that. Let's pray. God, we have heard of your fame. We've heard about who you are. We have heard about the deeds 
the things that you do in people's lives, the things that you've done throughout history. But we ask that you would do it again in our lifetime, in our day, in our city. In our time, God, we pray that you would make that known and that we would remember your mercy and your grace and we would live victoriously in that. That's our prayer, God, and we offer it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for being here. You are dismissed.